and uh, it has done so much for me, for my family. And uh, even when you get in dark times and you don't know what to trust, you can trust God's word. When men fail you, when churches fail you, when people fail you, when things fail you, God's word doesn't fail. It's true and uh, stood the test of times. I'm thankful for the word of God. Thank you for the men of God that preach God's word. And so uh, Brother Myers is going to come. He's going to preach for us and do a little bit of drawing too. And so I'm excited about that. He asked you all to go what I thought was it was. I told him I couldn't tell very, very well. He said, good. You're not supposed to know yet until I get finished. So uh, pay close attention. I'm sure you get something to be a blessing to you. Thank Looking you, forward Pastor. to it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sure do appreciate the opportunity to preach here. And it's a special blessing to to uh, get to preach to Bill. Amen. And uh, yes, I started uh, karate in 1963, and the last time I practiced was just a couple of weeks ago. And so uh, I'm still active, amen. I just promoted uh, six black belts in jujitsu uh, last July and taught some uh, horrible techniques to them that uh, you don't want to know about, amen. And, uh, but uh, I appreciate the uh, special because that goes right along with what I'm talking about here. We give these bumper stickers away to anybody that will put them on their car or where they can be seen. We don't sell anything. We give them away with, under four conditions. One, that you'll put them where they can be seen. Amen? Two, that you will pray for Terry and I every time you think of it. Amen? How many of you read bumper stickers on the back of people's cars? See what I'm saying? Looking around the hands. Now, exactly what the brother that was singing, God's word changes lives. What's wrong in your country? How many of you know that something's wrong in your country? What's wrong is they have rejected the word of the Lord and what wisdom is in them. Your senators and congressmen are arguing about the sex of a potato. Is it Mr. Potato Head or Mrs. Potato Head? Do you know what I'm talking about, those of you that watch the news? I am not exaggerating anything. Now, the reason for all that is because of new Bible versions. New Bible versions are not the Word of God. And so the people that attend faithfully, First, Second, or Third Baptist Church, are not getting the Word of God placed in their hearts. And that's the reason why they think the way that they do. Amen? And what you can do is you can put one of these on the back of your car and you will preach. That's a sermon at a glance. Now, this is a takeoff on the coexist bumper sticker. How many of you have seen the coexist bumper sticker? Okay. Well, this is kind of a takeoff on it. This is the Muslims. This is the transgenders. This is the Jew. Amen. This is the peaceniks, the yin and the yang, the Eastern mystic religion people. I'll come over here where everybody can see. And uh, I hope I don't fall off of that thing. And this is the witches and that's the Satanists. What's the fastest growing religion in America? Satanism. Satanism because of, uh, what's his name? Uh, Harry Potter. Because of Harry Potter. I was at a pastor's meeting and that question was asked, what's the fastest growing religion in America? And I said, Mon Islam. He said, wrong. It's witchcraft. Satanism. Amen. And so uh, you put a thing on your car like that and you'll be preaching a sermon at a glance to by the time you drive through Austin about 1500 people and that will be more Bible than they'll get in a decade now we got one back there that says the party in hell has been canceled due to the fire uh, be sure your sin will find you. I don't know what the verse is. And I was in Las Vegas several years ago and I had that on the back of my pickup and 15 or 20 hell's angels and they had the jackets. They were hell's angels pulled up and parked right behind me. And I went back there and I said, hey guys, guys, this party has been canceled. Don't you be going. They all laughed at me and several of them took a track and went into the casino uh, laughing, amen. So point is, we give these away to whoever will put them on their car if you will pray for Terry and I every time you think of it, if somebody says, ooh, I like your bumper sticker, you have to offer to give it to them. You see, it's a magnet. Amen? And uh, any juicy stories that come out of that bumper sticker, you have to call the pastor and ask him to tell me the story. I might use it in preaching. Amen? And no, you may not get one for somebody that's not here. They have to come to the meeting, and you only get one. Amen. 
I like one piercing thought rather than to cover the back of my car with a bunch of stuff. And, uh, and so I hope that you'll consider doing that. If you've got a Bible, turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Oh, I, I forgot to say, we got some large ones and some that are nice and some that are nasty and some that are small. Amen? So I forgot to say that. John chapter 4. I want to preach to you a sermon called Growing a Garden. Growing a Garden. And uh, the Lord Jesus lays out here in this passage a little something about growing a crop of something. I'd, I'm from the panhandle of Texas, so I've been involved in, in hundreds of acres of wheat and maize and barley and, and then even uh, cotton and grown several things. And maybe you haven't done any of that, but I, I would venture to say that you can identify with some of the things that I'm saying here. And um, let's have a word of prayer and I'll start preaching. Father, I pray that you bless the preaching of your word this evening. I pray that you'd come and minister the word of God to these people. I pray that the Holy Spirit would breathe upon the pages of this book. Let that fresh breeze that blows through these words enlighten our hearts, Lord, and give us strength to live for thee from day to day. I pray now, Lord, that you would apply Luke eleven thirteen 13 to what's about to be said here, for thou knowest that I qualify. For you said, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So, Lord, by virtue of my life, thou knowest, but I know how to give good gifts unto my children. You taught me that. I pray, Lord, that by virtue of my qualifications, that you would give me the Holy Spirit to minister the Word of God this evening, and I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. John, John chapter, John chapter 4, verse 34. It says, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye that there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap uh, that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered in, into their labor. And that's the way that the ministry is, that's the way that soul winning is, amen, is that one person does one part of the job and another person does another part of the job. Uh, we have a Savior here, himself demonstrating the meaning or in the method of soul winning, and he was at Jacob's well there, amen, whenever he, whenever he taught that lesson. And I was in Israel several years ago, and, and one of the things that I'd like to do if I ever get to go back is go to Jacob's well and try to win a soul, amen? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to fulfill a verse of Scripture. I'd like to fulfill a verse of Scripture in my life, that is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, figuratively speaking, my Jerusalem is Tyler, Texas. That's where we live, and I'm a testimony there, Amen. I pass out tracts and witness and the like. I just preached on the street here in Temple, Texas and, and the like. But the thing is, is that figuratively speaking, my Jerusalem is Tyler. My Judea is East Texas. And I've witnessed all around East Texas and preached there. Amen. Uh, we, uh, some of us guys, we decided we wanted to go street preaching. And so what we did was we loaded up and we went over to Italy. And uh, we preached there for a while, and then, uh, then we went into Rome, amen, and preached there in Rome. And I've preached in Athens, and I've preached in Paris. I've preached outside of the Garden of Eden, amen. Te Texas, that is. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Texans think that's funny, but when I preach it out of state, they, don't, they can't catch on, amen. <laughs> but it was Italy, Texas, amen. Well, anyway, and point being is, is that that's Judea. And then Samaria. I'm in Samaria now to me. Amen. That's further on out. But listen, if you're going to fulfill that verse literally, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go to Israel and you're going to have to uh, go to Jerusalem 
and be a witness there. And a couple of years ago, I got to do that very thing. I got to go to Jerusalem and be a witness. Amen? A witness. And I won a soul in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, thank God, that by the grace of God, I won that soul. And then in Judea, on the way down to the Dead Sea, I got to win a soul there, 10 feet below sea level. Now, how many soul winners do we have in here? Let me see your hands. How many of you have ever won a soul to Christ below sea level? Here I, here I was. You won somebody below sea level? Amen. Submariner, I'll bet you, aren't you? No? Well, thing is, is that I was, you know, I was boasting to my wife about how that I'd won somebody below sea level. She says, well, honey, isn't Brother Sochet's church below sea level in New Orleans? She stole my thunder, amen. But anyway, moral of the story is, is that, and then I went to uh, uh, the hill of Armageddon, which is in Samaria. And uh, there, that fellow wasn't quite ready to get saved yet, amen. He wasn't ready to get saved. And so although I was a witness, I wasn't able to lead him to a saving knowledge of Christ. I did gather a stone while I was in, in, on the hill of Armageddon. And uh, I intend to throw that at the Pope if he ever comes to America. You guys laughed courteously, but did you notice that I did not laugh? Because I'm serious. I've got that stone. And you say, well, you'll, you'll go to jail for it. Yeah, I know it'll be worth it. Amen. Can you imagine telling that story at the judgment seat of Christ? But anyway, moral of the story is, is this, is, is that uh, the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Now, that's a scientific statement. Uttermost part of the earth shows that the earth is round. It's a sphere. There's one certain part of the earth that is further away from Jerusalem than any other part of the earth. And if there's any flat earthers in here, and buddy, they're around, amen. You got a verse of scripture you're going to have to contend with. Now, I have a, I have a, a trip planned to Marta Yura Island. Some of you missionaries may know where that is, down near Tahiti. And I hope to go down there and, and, and go to Marta Yura Island and stand up and preach on the street in Marta Yura Island. That's the uttermost part of the earth. If you look it up geophysically, that's the uttermost part of the earth from Jerusalem. Amen. And so I want to fulfill that verse of Scripture. But right now, as I preach right now, I am currently uh, fulfilling all four points because this is going up on the web. And anywhere in the world, you can get on the website and you can see that. Amen. That hasn't been going on for very long, amen? Not, it's been, the first time I did it was in 1998. I was on God's Learning Channel out in Midland, Texas. And uh, what happened was, is I preached a chalk talk on God's Learning Channel. And that was back in the days whenever the satellites were great big dishes, you know. They didn't have the little dish networks and stuff. But they had these great big dishes. And, and after the, the preaching, I got an email, because email was up, from Kuwait, and somebody in Kuwait said, we, we sure enjoyed the program this evening. So that was a great blessing to me, amen? I'm trying to fulfill this verse of Scripture. But uh, verse 35, the Savior correlates soul winning with a field crop. Now, maybe you've never grown a field crop, but uh, the question is, is have you ever grown a garden, Amen. How many of you have ever grown a garden? Well, that's the title of this sermon, Growing a Garden, Growing a Garden. And I want to talk about some of the things that you do whenever you grow a garden, amen? Because according to the Savior, growing a garden is similar to the ministry in some, in some ways. Growing a garden is similar to the ministry. And uh, if you understand how you grow a garden, well, then you might understand some things about the ministry, too. The best garden I ever grew was at 3707 South Cimarron in Amarillo, Texas. We bought that house, and I went out in the backyard, and I said, I'm going to grow a garden right here. And uh, my first point in growing a garden is the first thing that you probably will have to do in growing a garden is poisoning poisoning you see where i wanted to grow that garden there was a lawn growing there amen there was a lawn of grass and what i had to do was i had to go out there and poison that grass and kill it uh, so that i could uh, put my garden in there and as you deal with people up and down over here you're dealing with people that already have an idea of what they think spiritual truth is all about 
Amen? And what you've got to do is you've got to show them that there is nothing to what they believe. <laughs> I mean, there's atheists, there's all sorts of religious folks out there. Amen? I was in Vernon, Texas, and I was running my, one of my bumper stickers. The, my, one bumper sticker on one side said, I will not vote for any communist, socialist, democrat for any office, and neither should you. Shame on you if you do. I have worked against communism all my life. I'm a Vietnam veteran, amen? And not only that, but uh, uh, in 1999, I was walking along the walls of the Kremlin. We went over to Russia to, to uh, hand out Bibles on the Volga River. That's where the Meyer family is from. They're Germans from Russia. And uh, I, I saw Joseph Stalin's grave there. I spit on it and stepped on it and cursed him in the name of the Lord and thought I did the right spiritual thing, Amen. Is there anybody got a problem with that? <laughs> anyway, and so uh, what happened was is uh, that uh, I also defiled Lennon's body, but I won't go into any of that any further. <laughs> well, anyway, this guy in Vernon, Texas, that's where I was at. I was chasing a rabbit there. Uh, but this guy in Vernon, Texas saw my bumper sticker at, at Dairy Queen, and he said, boy, I like your bumper sticker. And I said, well, did you see this one here? And it was one of these here, one of these scripture bumper stickers. And uh, I said, uh, what do you think of that one? He said, no, no, I don't believe that stuff. He said, I'm an atheist. I said, oh, no, you're not. You're not an atheist. Now, what I'm doing is I'm teaching you how to poison. Okay? You're not an atheist. You see, let me ask you something, my friend. When, when, you, when were you born? What's your birthday? And he told me his birthday. And for instance, February 29th, 1948, A.D. Now, each one of you, if I ask you what your birthday is, you would give me a birth date in relation to the birth date of the greatest man that ever lived. Amen? And you are very fastidious about that birth date. And so is every atheist around here. Not only that, but you've got this thing in your pocket called a cell phone. And at the foundation of all that software, there's a date. And you know what that date is? It's in relation to the greatest man that ever lived. Amen? And boy, I mean, if that thing gets off, you are in a tizzy. Am I right? Did you know at the foundation of all the software in Saudi Arabia to operate the uh, the oil pumps in Saudi Arabia, at the foundation of all those computers, there's a date. And it ain't the year of the dog. It's, it's March the, what is today, 6th or 8th? 6th, 2000, uh, 2022 A.D. Amen? And not only that, but in, uh, in uh, China, where all your junk comes from that you've got all around you there. <laughs> Those machines are run by computers, and at the foundation of that computer is a date. And they are very fastidious to keep that date correct and the time correct. Amen? And so I reminded this fellow that he was no more of an atheist than nothing, that he believed in my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I told him, my friend, I said, if you don't get saved, What's going to happen is you're going to go to hell, you're going to burn, you're going to burn forever, and you'll never get out! And just the same way that you jumped, he jumped too, amen? Now you know what I did was I poisoned what was already growing there in his garden spot, amen? I poisoned that by showing him the fallacy of what he was believing. You can use that on college professors because those college professors, the next time they have to set the time in their classrooms, they're gonna, it's going to gall them to have to set it according to the birth date of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's poisoning. I've had several people that I've led to Christ. Here's Robbie Allen, for instance, a knowledgeable evolutionist, an atheist, that got saved by my challenge to read the book of John. I said, you've tried other things. This was at Amarillo College. I said, you've tried other things. Try this. Just here in John, just read a chapter a day, and, and every time you read, pray like this. Uh, God, if there is a God, 
That's fair, don't you think? If this is your word, then reveal yourself through your word. And then I tricked him into saying this. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> he got saved before he got through John chapter 6. I've done that twice, and both guys got saved before they got through John chapter 6. Amen. Now that shows the power of the word of God just all by itself. Amen. And so what I'm saying is, is just like what the, the special singer sang, God's word changes lives. Its power cannot be denied. Robbie Allen wouldn't deny it, amen. And so the second thing, the second thing after, uh, after poisoning is plowing. Now, that's what you, that's what you do after you... Uh, after you get the ground prepared and, and uh, get all the stuff that's growing in there, all the weeds and the entanglement, amen, you plow that place. I plowed up the ground where the garden was to grow. One year in Canyon, Texas, I hired another guy. I, I saw an ad in the paper. I didn't have a plow, so I hired a guy to come in and plow my, uh, my garden spot in town there. He showed up with a 4010 John Deere tractor. <laughs> He was a farmer that needed to make some extra money, and he showed up with a, with a not a one-way, but I can't remember what it was called now, but a disc, and he took two swaths, and that was the, he was done, amen. His, his unit just barely fit into my, uh, into my uh, garden spot. But the point I'm making is, is that this, that's the only part he had to do in my garden. That's all he did. He didn't do any of the planning or the preparatory or any of the other stuff. All he did was the plowing. And so what I'm saying is, is the Savior said, other men have labored and ye have entered into their labors. Some people want instant soul winning. And brethren, the reason why there's not as many people getting saved today as there was back in the 60s and 70s and 80s is because back during the 60s and 70s and 80s, we were working off of labor that had gone on in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And we got to reap their, their labors, amen? But since those days, most of what is being preached on the airwaves out there is not the Word of God. It's the ESV or the NIV or the CSB or the what you name it. <laughs> And that's not the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will only use something that's holy. And that is a King James Bible. Or, in Spanish, Reina Valera, or so forth and so on. You understand what I mean. You can hire the plowing done by a street preacher. There sits one right there. Do we have any other street preachers in here? I mean, Bill Bailey and I have spent countless hours out preaching on the street. And we've seen some stuff happen. You get out there and preach on the streets, you'll see some things happen, amen? One year, we were, we were at the Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is big, not only in New Orleans, but in Pensacola, too. And we were down there preaching hell, fire, and damnation, stewed down to a fine poison. And, uh, and I looked down the street, and there was this guy that was leaning up against the rear window of his car with his hand back. Well, I've got, I'll tell that story in a second. We, we were preaching, and there was this car that got blocked in, and it, was, it had three people in the front seat and three people in the back. We preached and preached and preached and preached, and they were dancing around their hurricanes and Singapore slings and just having the best time when we were preaching the hellfire and damnation. The next year, we went back down there, and here was this guy, and he was laying on the, the trunk of his car with his hands behind his head, you know, kind of long-haired and scraggly type fella, and... I told Bill, I said, I'm going to go down there and give this guy a track. So as I went down further down there, the closer I got, the bigger his smile got. And he said, boy, that sounds good. And I said, what, the music? <laughs> he said, no, that preaching. And what had happened was Monty Bosha had gotten saved. He was the driver of the car that had gotten blocked in. We, it was parked right beside of us here while we were preaching. And Monty had gotten saved and had been looking for us for a year and couldn't find us and said, well, I got saved at Mardi Gras last year. I'll go back down to Mardi Gras and maybe they'll be back down there. And there we were. He graduated from Bible school and I'm still in contact with him, amen. And so the point I'm getting at is, is that street preaching bears fruit, amen. And uh, uh, you ought to consider doing some of that. 
it's still not outdated. People hate it, though, I'll tell you. Sinners hate it. <laughs> anyway, and so plowing. I have seen people run forward an invitation after a hell sermon. Carl Miller is a friend of ours, and Carl Miller and I were down there at the Mobile, uh, Mobile Bay Bridge, and uh, there's a light there, and when the light turns, you've got to drive all the way over the, the bridge before you can turn around. <clears throat> and we were preaching, and a fellow drove up, and he, he talked to Brother Carl. I listened in on the conversation. He said, uh, I was here 10 minutes ago. He said, uh, what did you mean by lake of fire? Brother Carl was standing in the back of a pickup and he says that if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell and you're going to be cast into the, and he heard these words, the lake of fire. And the light turned green and he drove across the bridge, turned around, drove back across the bridge, turned around and talked to Brother Carl. What do you mean by lake of fire? Brother Carl led that guy to Christ. Amen. You know what that's like? That's like plowing. Street preaching is not a nice ministry. <laughs> Nobody likes it. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none, verse, uh, verse 10, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of e cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. Look at this. There is no fear of God before their eyes. If you want to know what's wrong in your society, that's part of it right there. There is no fear of God. And one of the reasons why there's no fear of God is because no leather lung street preacher has breathed fire down their neck and told them they're going to hell. The only time they've been told to go to hell is by their, by their workman where he said, I'll go to hell. And he knew that that didn't amount to nothing. But buddy, when a guy stands up with a Bible in his hand and points it right in your face, and says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell. And that kind of talk right there coming from the voice of a preacher has a different effect upon the sinner. Amen? So the third thing that you do whenever you're growing a garden is found in Luke chapter 13, verse 6. Luke chapter 13. Turn over there if you would. You'll probably, you might be surprised at this point right here. <laughs> Luke chapter 13, verse 6. Because what it says is he, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he under the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if then, if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So the third step in growing a good garden is dunging. How many of you have ever done that? Any anybody? <laughs> well, I did. I went out to a horse farm, and I got a pickup load of, of horse manure, and buddy, I slung manure for a whole day, amen. <laughs> you guys are taking me too serious here. The only comment I got out of that, there wasn't anybody that thought I was doing a good job. Nobody stuck their head, oh, what are you doing? Nobody like that. The only comment I got was, is my neighbor stuck his head up over the fence and said, boy, that stuff sure stinks. Now, if you want to know who does the most dunging, it's the Lord. Amen? The Lord is the one that does the dunging. Only God can do this phase of the gardening process. When the sinner's life begins to stink, he's been dunged. When the gas tank says, I'm empty. When the boss says, you're fired. When the, light, when the wife says, I'm leaving. When the doctor says, it's cancer. And when the pediatrician says, would you step into this room here? 
I need to talk to you. You know what I mean? Buddy, life is just not as sweet anymore with your good paying job and your fancy car and and your your casino accounts. Amen? At a time like that. You know what's going on? The gardener is is preparing you. The problem with dunging is, is that you get it on not only what you're what you're trying to uh, fertilize, but you might get it on yourself too. That's when the sinner begins to seek the one that has been seeking him all along. I've got a letter here from Sister Barbara Reynolds. She sent me a letter some time back. There was uh, somebody that wrote her a letter, and uh, and it goes like this. You might recognize it. Requesting prayer for a woman that had her son that her son had won to the Lord. I won't give you her name. Her husband has stepped on, out on her with another woman, and her daughters told her that if she takes him back, she will lose them. She just lost her mother a few months ago. She has at times thought about taking her life. She is at a loss as to what to do. You say, what's wrong with her? Her life stinks. She needs some help from heaven. Amen? All right. So the fourth phase of growing a garden is planting. Now you can ease off, amen. Ah, you can enjoy it. <laughs> planting. The planting can be done even though, the, the thing about planting is, it can be done even if the previous steps have never been done. You see, what you can do is you can take a, uh, your, your planting and uh, where the grass was growing there, what I could have done was, is I could have just, without plowing, without uh, fertilizing, Without doing any of that, what I could have done was just went out there and planted my seeds in that lawn grass, amen? And some of it may have sprung up, and I may have even gotten a tomato or a pepper or a squash out of it, but it wouldn't have been as good of a crop as if the ground had been prepared. Now, if you've got a Bible, take, take it and turn to Luke chapter 8, verse 11, because this is where most people are today. Luke chapter 8, verse 11. This is where most people are in this day and age. Amen. Luke chapter 8. It says, Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they, which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, they don't get saved, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they, which, when they have heard, go forth, and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring forth, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Now there's a companion passage in Mark chapter 4, I'll read it for you. Verse 18, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they that, which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundredfold. Amen? You see... What happens is, is that a lot of people, what happens to them is, is that the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things enter in. And although they're saved, they become unfruitful. You see, I believe in eternal security. Amen. I believe once saved, always saved. As a Baptist, I believe there's such of a thing as backsliding. I do not recommend it. Amen. But if you want to know part of the trouble that we have in our life out here, if you want to know part of the trouble, it's not just saved people living like, or excuse me, lost people living like hell. It's also backslidden saved people living like hell. Amen? And, and what happened was is that the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things. Now the thing about planting is, is you can't always tell by looking when someone has been planted. You can't always tell by looking. I can remember my dad, he was a wheat farmer up in, in, uh, in Oklahoma, 
And what he would do is he would plant, and then several weeks later, he'd go walking out in the field, and he would dig up to see if the wheat was sprouting. And so whenever you plant, in other words, when you give away a gospel tract, or whenever you do a verbal witness, or when somebody pulls up behind one of these sermons with a glance, amen, that is the planting of the Word of God. And you can't always tell when somebody's been planting. There's several types of planting. There's the broadcast, like they used to do with wheat and barley and maize. That's, and there's where you drop seeds into a trench like you plant beans. And then there's the dibble plant, where you, that's how you plant okra. You plant them about four inches apart, amen, okra part, uh, okra uh, seeds and the like. And then there's the scattered in a mound. You dig out a mound and you scatter squash seeds in there for a hill of squash. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. And then there's uh, the kind beneath the cage. That's how you plant tomatoes. Because you hope the tomato plant grows up and, and the, the cage will help support the, the limbs of the tomato plant and the, and the, uh, the uh, tomatoes won't weight it down. Planting is done verbally on a gospel tract or on a bumper sticker. I was in Lamar, Colorado uh, last summer, I guess it was. <laughs> And I have on the back of my motorhome, it says, uh, you must be born again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved. And, and we had to drive the next day, and the people right next to us, I'm telling you, I mean, from here to the pul pulpit here, out from my, wind, uh, my ear laying on my pillow, there was four guys that stayed up visiting until 2 or 3 o'clock in the night. And I had to get up and get everything together and drive the next day. And I said, I'm going to get those two guys in the morning. Amen. And so what happened was, is when time came, I got up. I opened the doors on my pickup. I turned my sound system up as loud as I could. And I played John Philip Sousa's American March. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I thought they would get up goose-stepping out of their beds, amen. Little did I know they had already got up and left for work. But there was a, two boys across the road from me, as close as I am to the piano there, and I was wandering around outside hoping these guys would come out, not knowing that they'd already left. And these two boys came out, and one of them says, Boy, that's great music. What does that sign mean? I mean, he said it just like that. Boy, that's great music. What does that sign mean? You must be born again. I got to show him what that sign meant. Amen. Him and his brother were born again, standing right there at the end of my, uh, of my trailer. Amen. And what that was, they had already been plowed and planted and whatever else, and I got to reap the harvest. There are people, if you get one of these bumper stickers, you know the Bible says, the Bible says, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder and soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen? <laughs> and i tell you something. There is no more pleasant place to, watch, to, to see that happen than in your rearview mirror. <laughs> I see people, you know, two elderly ladies coming up there and You know they've been had, amen? Uh, I see people, they drive up behind me, they see the thing, they're shocked, and then they can look any other direction except at my sign. You know what I know? I know their heart has been pierced. Amen? What happened was, is they have been plowed and planted and prepared for a nice, sweet, kind, little soul winner such as yourself to come along and say, Jesus loves you, and I love you too. But you see, it was that plowing and dunging and planting that went beforehand that you enter into their works. Amen? You enter into their works. And so it's not just you that's doing the work. It's the Lord that's... It, it's really the Holy Spirit that is doing all the work of leading souls to Christ. You're just entering into His work. Amen? <laughs> and so, thing is... Uh, I've had souls saved off of these bumper stickers. I can tell you story after story. 
Many in our nation are not getting the Word of God, even though they go to First, Second, or Third Baptist Church because of new versions. Fifthly, in, in uh, growing a garden is the watering. Amen? The watering. Now, if you don't water, you're not going to get much of a crop. Amen? And what watering is, is that's prayer. I mean, listen, whenever you pass out a tract to somebody, pray for them. Amen? There may not be anybody else saved in their life that prays for their soul. You may be the only saved person that prays for their soul. My deacon, whenever I was pastoring in Amarillo, Deacon Tiefertiller, Deacon Tiefertiller t- we said this, we were talking about the best children, and, and that's where I got that line. Deacon Tiefertiller said, there may not be anybody that is saved that prays for these kids. So we were diligent to pray for them, amen? And so I, I would implore you, if you can't go out and be a witness, if you can't go out and preach on the street, if you can't do that, I would implore you to get the names of some of these people and pray for them, amen? Pray for them. You may be the last line of defense before... See, the Lord is only obligated to one witness. The Lord is only, the Lord is only obligated to give them one witness, but your prayer would change God's viewpoint and give them a second witness and a third and a fourth. Amen? So watering. And then, sixthly, a season. Only God can bring a season. You see, you don't go out to the garden and prepare the ground and plant the seeds and go back in and wash your hands in the sink and come back out with a basket expecting you to get any fruit, do you? No, what has to happen is, is a season has to happen. That's where the Lord exercises their lives, amen, and brings them to the end of themselves. That's what needs to happen is, is they need to come to the end of themselves and see that there is a need for them to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. That that their education and the things of this world and the deceitfulness of riches are not all that needs to, that they need to have a fulfilled life, amen, but what they need to do is they need to have the Lord in their life, amen. You might recognize this drawing. A season, only God can bring a season. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 4, it says, The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So things have been going on in this person's life. Things are not pretty in this person's life. And then all of a sudden, God does something to be a blessing to them. And the person that the Lord has been seeking is now seeking Him. Because He gave Him a second chance, and a third chance, and a fourth chance. Because you asked the Lord to do that. So, the question I've got, and I'll say it again later, is what part would you like to have in this ministry? Would you like to have the, the uh, plowing, or the poisoning, or the dunging, <laughs> or the planting? We need laborers in all these fields. Me! I want to have a part in every part of it. Amen? So then there's the harvesting. That's soul winning. Amen? That's soul winning. I'm here to tell you that there's not very many people doing soul winning these days. Everybody, are, are you saved? Everybody and their dog is saved in this country. Amen? They've learned the language. What you're going to have to do is learn how to dig a little bit deeper. You're going to have to say, well, yeah, but let me ask you this. Are you born again? There is no one right way to win souls. I may win souls different from the way the pastor does, but good night. We need a bunch of people that are out there winning souls, and there's not very many of those. Amen? There are just very few that are actually doing it. Now take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Now it's going to get rough. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. You see what Jesus Christ says there? He says, follow me. 
Turn to it. Matthew 4, 19. Follow me, and I will make you to be fishers of men. Listen, I know something about fishing. If you're not catching, if you go fishing, you may not catch fish this time. You may not catch fish next time. But bless God, eventually you're going to catch a fish if you go fishing. And if you're not catching no fish, I know something about you. You ain't fishing. Because Jesus Christ said, follow me, and I'll make you to be fishers of men. You're not following him if you're not winning souls. Amen, amen. Amen, Brother Meyer. That's the truth. Amen. There's something wrong with your spiritual life if you're not running some souls and catching some fish because Jesus Christ said, follow me and I'll make you to be fishers of men. Amen. Getting awful quiet in here. <laughs> if you're not catching them, it's because you're not following him. I was taking my, my first wife to the doctor. She had a ma major stroke. She was paralyzed on her right side and couldn't speak. I was carrying her to the doctor in a handicapped van playing Brother Duty's song, Lord, Here's My Basket. In each and every life, there's a basket filled with goods. Although it may not be used exactly as it should, some throw it all away or keep it for themselves. Others never use it. They just place it on the shelf. And it comes down through there. Lord, here's my basket. It's not much I know, but take it and use it. Please don't refuse it. Maybe it will grow. I know I could keep it or give it to you. So, Lord, here's my basket. You don't have to ask it. It's the least I can do. And I was playing that for her. And she's sitting back there strapped in a wheelchair, singing in her stroke impaired language <laughs> buddy her basket was all small shortly after that megan volter got saved i led megan volter to christ <laughs> When Megan Volter came to church and she got baptized, she said, I want you to understand that when you see me get baptized, uh, I'm washing the Mormon off of me. I asked her, I said, what do you mean by that? She said, well, I've been baptized over, over 500 times, 160 times one day. She said, the reason I got saved, The reason I got saved is because of Gail Myers' sweet smile and Ray Myers' bold witness and my son, Stephen Myers' compassionate ministry. Now, my wife had a basket filled with goods. It's not much I know. She was singing along. I'd never forgotten it. What about your basket? What about your basket? What are you going to do with your basket? In each and every life, there's a basket filled with goods. Although it may not be used exactly as it should, some throw it all away or keep it for themselves. Others never use it. They just place it on the shelf. You've got a basket. I know this, if you put a hook in the water, you'll catch a fish. The biggest fish I ever caught was at Little Cottonwood uh, 
lake in western Oklahoma, and I had a gold treble hook, and I had laid the rod down to go eat supper. It wasn't baited, and in laying it down as a little boy, I let the hook dangle down in the water. Well, I was eating my lunch, and Dad said, your fishing rod, go get your fishing rod. <laughs> and what had happened was, is a little minnow had gotten hung up on that gold treble hook, and the biggest bass I ever caught bit on that, on that uh, minnow. The biggest bass I ever caught was on an unbaited hook, a golden hook. My friend, if you're not winning souls, there's something wrong in your spiritual life. Amen. Now the next step here, by the way, I'm crying up here. Any of you that think that I'm a sissy, I will meet you at the dojo. I'll be at the judo dojo next Tuesday. A lot of effort needs to be put in these next step because the soul winning is only the first step. There's assurance. What you need to do is you need to give that person assurance by showing them 1 John 5, 12 through 13. You need to encourage them to confess Christ like it says in Romans 10, 9. You have to come to church to do that. Then baptism, Acts 2, 41, they that gladly received his word were baptized. And then you should pray about it. Pray about being baptized. And then discipleship, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman need, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you lead a soul to Christ, you've got about 11 days for them to, to get in and begin to grow before they begin to fall away. Now the verse on that, if you're interested, if you're a Bible student, is in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and I'll read it for you. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel, and Laban and Hezeroth, and Dizahab. Listen to this. There are 11 days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir and the Kadesh Barnea. If you recall, they received the law, and then what they did was they came up to Kadesh Barnea and they turned back. And it's been my observation that you have just about two weeks or 11 days, once you lead a soul to Christ, to get them in before they're going to go the way of the world for a while and wander in the wilderness for a while. Now, that's a spiritual application of the verse. I realize that, not a doctrinal. I'm getting close to the end here. Cleaning or discipleship. I'm going to use tomatoes because that's just a simple illustration. But you know what you do when you go out there and you pick some tomatoes off the vine? You bring them in and you wash them off. Amen? And what that's like in work of the ministry is like discipleship. Like discipleship. Teaching the basic truths of God's Word and new versions. Eternal security, prayer, the local church, giving, dealing with sin, liberty in Christ, their testimony. And then next is preparing. The simplest recipe that I know is sliced tomatoes. That's a recipe, amen? How many of you like sliced tomatoes? Let me see, see what I mean. You know what I'm talking about. Now, that's preparing the fruit that you've picked. That's deeper Bible study. How to win souls. Premillennialism. The judgment seat of Christ. The doctrines. The seven mysteries. I got to do that to this young man sitting right back there. He went off to Bible school with me and got into this deeper Bible study here, though, but I got to disciple him, amen. But the absolute best part of growing a garden is where you go to the refrigerator and you take out that plate of sliced tomatoes and you set it on the table in front of that honored guest and you say, these are from my garden. <laughs> and you know what that is? Bill, you know what that is? That's where you get to serve it up to the Lord Jesus Christ, one of your fruit in a garden that you grew. I got some of those. I got Bill Bailey, Glenn Stalker, Brandon Freeze, Stephen Meyer, Bob Matthews, Gary Boyles. Question, what part of this ministry 
do you want to have a part in anyway? What part of this ministry do you want to have a part in? You want to have a part in the sowing, the plowing, the planting, the harvesting, the discipleship, Bible Institute, amen? I was knocking doors in Amarillo, Texas. And I led a soul to Christ. And whenever he lifted up his head, he said this. He said, aren't you the guy that I see preaching down on Polk Street? <laughs> I just happened to knock doors down. And there was a guy that I had ministered to in months before in street preaching. And I got the privilege of leading him to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, I said all that to say this. Pastor, I'm through. What part would you like to have a part in? Do you know somebody that has been looking for Christ? Do you know somebody at work that might respond to your witness and your testimony? I would beg you to bring their name to this prayer altar here and pray for them. You may be the only one that prays for their soul. Father, I pray that you bless this sermon and bless this people and bless this message, Lord. And may it resound in these hearts, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you can stand with us uh, tonight, she's going to play. And uh, let me encourage you just what do you, do you have something you could be doing to be a witness to somebody? I mean, it could be a door hanger, it could be a gospel track, it could be a gospel witness, just whatever it is you could be doing to be a witness to somebody. You probably do more than what we're doing right now, I'm sure. Uh, to try to be a gospel witness. And so I would just encourage you to do that. She's going to play. Why don't you come pray this evening and ask the Lord maybe what he'd have you to do or maybe to reveal somebody in your life that he would have you to give a gospel track to, be a witness to. Maybe you just have somebody to pray for that you know.